Okay, let's uh, let's start this uh, talk, and uh, in this session, we will talk about Azure Service Bus and microservices. Uh, first, I'm going to start by telling you who I am and uh, what I do. My name is Bore, and I'm a software engineer. I have more than 20 years of experience uh, as a software developer. I work most of the projects that I've been involved. I have been working as a backend developer, but uh, in some projects I've been architect as well. So this is uh, who I am. Uh, I live in Sweden, just uh, outside of the Gothenburg. Uh, and uh, run my own company, work as a subcontractor here. So, if we start this talk and uh, with a, with a question, what Service Bus is? Uh, Service Bus is a cloud-based messaging system that run uh, that can that enables communication between multiple services both for services that run on cloud and on-premise. So the key word here is cloud-based messaging system, which means that it can run only in Azure. But the good part here is that it can be accessed from anywhere else. It can be accessed from services that we run on-premise or from the services that we run on different cloud uh, platform. It doesn't have to be Azure. For, for us to be able to uh, consume Azure Service Bus services. If we continue with the question why we should use Azure Service Bus or Service Bus, before I answer this question, I just want to say that most of the uh, service brokers or service buses work within or work almost the same. So if we understand one, we will pretty much understand uh, or be able to set up different uh, providers as well. So if we understand how Azure Service Bus works, the principle for uh, or the principle for RabbitMQ is pretty much the same. <clears throat> so if we continue why we should use uh, Service Bus, uh, most or there are two key or two main reasons why why I think we should use Azure Service Bus. The system that we build, if we build it using microservices, will become more loosely coupled. And we will talk about uh, more about that uh, later on. And the system, the, the workload will be distributed by Service Bus itself within the scale of uh, that we have configured for our service instances. So let's say that we have one service and we have 10 instances of the same service running, the Azure Service Bus will distribute the workload between those 10 instances. So I'm going to, I'm going to describe you how that works soon. <clears throat> but uh, let's just uh, understand the, the, the main or the basics how Service Bus or queues work. So let's imagine that we have a publisher and we have a consumer. Publisher publishes a message to a service bus and the consumer will receive a copy of that message. This is done by a service bus. So let's imagine publisher publish a message. Service bus will take over and the publisher's responsibility ends there. Ends where, where the message reaches service bus. So publisher will say, okay, I, I have a message to publish and it tells service bus the publisher's responsibility as there. Now, service bus will take over and deliver a copy of that message to a consumer and make sure that that message is going to be processed only once. This is very important. Service bus makes sure that uh, this is that copy will be uh, processed successfully only once. So as soon as we tell service bus, now you now we can acknowledge the service, or the message. The service bus will remove that message from the queue and 
and uh, send the the next one in queue. Service Bus uses topics for publishing a message and subscription for subscribing on the, the those topic and receiving a copy of those messages that are published or uh, that are published to that subscription uh, that topic sorry so every consumer uh, let's say c1 c2 c3 should have their own subscription on those topics that they are interested to uh, listen on or, or receive uh, messages from so let's let's uh, describe this how this works. If a publisher publishes a message now, the service bus will clone that message uh, and make sure that every consumer that is interested on that uh, message will receive a copy. So consumer consumer number two number one can be let's say a uh, person service. Consumer number two can be invoice service. Consumer number three can be payment service. And if a publisher says, okay, I have a message to publish because a subscriber has done a payment, that that message will be sent to all the services that are interested in that, that topic or that message. This is how, how service bus works now why why how does service bus make our system more loosely coupled if we if we look at the, the example where we have a publisher and let's say we receive a, a new request for adding a new customer the publisher will publish a message let's say new customer added and consumer which in this which is uh, service 2 in this case will receive a copy of that but in case that service 2 is down or is in maintain mode and we cannot consume the message the service the message will be there for service 2 to consume so service 1 can continue and publish messages to service bus and those will be saved saved in service bus until the consumer consumes them so when the consumer is back online again the messages will be delivered to service two one by one and those will be consumed uh, successfully by service two now I've chosen Azure service bus and uh, microservices because I have the friend here in Sweden uh, redesign the architecture for this system and I'm going to show you how we've done it and what we've changed so today in Sweden there are uh, cars with the uh, hybrid cars or electric cars are becoming more popular and companies have started building their, or ch their, their or own charging stations around uh, big cities now and sell subscription to their customers I have uh, I'm a, a customer and because I have a electric car so there are different different places where you can just park the car and start uh, start uh, charging it so <clears throat> as you can see around areas here in Gothenburg uh, we have 77 uh, 77 uh, charging station in this area 53 here 61 in here 30 around here and so on so companies are selling subscription and then you can just park the car go buy groceries or whatever you need to do and then come back and then uh, continue drive uh, and the car hopefully will be charged or fully charged now the 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 architecture that they had was within with using two different layers first layer was the public layer and the other one was the private layer both of them were, were apis so when a call came from front end from app or from our sensors that 
the was uh, out so as soon as the customer tried to authenticate or identify themselves by by RFID card that they received a call came here to public layer and then based on what they needed to do they call it different different uh, services this is fine because it it has been working for a while now and uh, it started with uh, trying to 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 split the logic so having the public layer only as an api and the private layer a little more accessing data or handling data for every database so the good part here was that none of these services shared the database with, with each other so they, they what they've done is build an api for every microservice and then the public layer tried to call them based on the need that they had this sometimes can be very costly because let's imagine that you have a call like that and you should think that or that you should take into consideration the uh, the latencies that you introduce so customer might call an order order might call a shipping or invoice or payments or accounts and every call that you do between services introduce approximately 100 milliseconds that is approximately because what what happens is that when when a call when you call from public layer the private layer here you have to do serialization of your payload and then transfer the the the, the payload to the uh, uh, customer in this case and deserialize that part of the payload and then call database back again serialize the 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 um, payload and deserialize it in service one here so in this case maybe you you need to call you all need to authenticate the user you need to check if the user has any unpaid ser uh, invoices or if the subscription is still valid and so on or if that card that the customer is trying to use is valid because you might lost the card and then you need to order another one so this is uh, how they've done it but in many cases the the call when when the user parked the car or the customer parked the car and wanted to start charging the uh, start the charging station it took almost 30 seconds for them to make sure or to receive a response from the uh, uh, from the <clears throat> system and they got longer and longer because the services need to call each other and it, it took it took us uh, it took them very long time for for responding now what we've changed is that we said that we want to have two two different axes the right x and the read x <coughs> sorry it's not corona it's uh, something on my throat <laughs> uh, so when gateway api called an aggregate we read the aggregate and we have the business bus uh, we have the bus business logic there now and it generates an call or an event to a service bus the service bus will deliver that to those services that are interested in here and make sure that they receive a copy of that message for those that are interested in that message now when we call when we read when we need to access the 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 user profile we had different read models and by saying i have a card that i need to access boom the api called the the uh, one of the services and said this user is trying to authenticate and we knew automatically that uh, what read model to call which was a denormalized model and we just added the information we just showed the information and uh, 
we didn't need to call multiple services to complete the operation. We just had everything in place there. So it was like more CQRS architecture or CQL planning the pattern uh, over the, the uh, uh, services. And when we needed to change something, we called always our write tags here, aggregates, publish a message, and then update the read models. So next time you call them, the, the response were extremely faster. So it, it was just an object and we needed to return. So this is how we changed from calling services one another, we changed to having services uh, more relaxed. <clears throat> so let's imagine now that in this case we have a call from, uh, from we call for from a new customer that tries to uh, register and when the call from the front end reaches public layer we call the customer and we save data here and in the meantime we need to call notification service here for notifying or for sending a thank uh, email and send the maybe authentication uh, information. Now, for some reason, notification is not working and the process cannot be completed because if a user tries to access that, we might have information in our database here that hasn't reached the notification service. As we discussed earlier here, if a if, if we would use service bus, service bus will save those messages here one by one. And when the service is back online again, those services will be delivered to, to, our, uh, to our service and the, our service will be able to consume them. Maybe we will have information about a new customer, but send the welcome letter after 30 minutes or something like that, but we will still have that information in place and the, the services will be able to consume them soon as they, soon as they can or are back online again. So talking about microservices and uh, service bus in 20 minutes, it's uh, just scratching a little bit, little bit of the surface, just because this this uh, subject or is is very uh, big and uh, i am planning uh, to just share some more small things with you just so that you have you can take those things in consideration when you plan the, the microservice architecture and service bus so when using microservice architecture try to not save your cache within one uh, within one service or in your, how can I say, in your memory. Because if you have multiple or, or if you run two instances of the same service, the cache might be uh, different in different instances within the same service. So that's uh, why we should use distributed cache. Consistency vs or versus inconsistency. Consistency vs inconsistency here is that consistency are sometimes painful to have or to have to guarantee 100% consistency. So what I try to do is when I draw, when I draw my bounded context, <clears throat> if something is critical to have consistency within the, the whole model, then I try to uh, to to draw bigger uh, bounded context because inconsistency might occur when using or it will occur when using microservices and another thing is that don't share logic or database between services because sharing logic uh, between services you might end up doing special uh, cases or building special cases within your code code for different services better to to uh, duplicate the code and run the service separately 
sharing database is a bad thing because your database will become your central contract and in those cases it's hard to change because you never know what services uh, uses what tables or what part of the collections so that's why i never recommend sharing logic or db between services now api first is a good thing because using api first you will build your gateway api so that your front end does need only one call per view and having that your your gateway api receives a call and then call maybe multiple services and return and build the contract and then return to the front end so the front end doesn't need to do an extra call so that's why i recommend having api first uh, when you work with a architecture uh, microsoft architecture in in this case logging is very important as well so try to log everything because logging it will help you keep track on uh, on things and uh, correlation ids are very important to have because you might have a message that runs through different services and in one of them fails now being able to 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 chain those uh, the 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 path for the same service or for the same message through all the services is very important so if you change if you if you if you can chain them the the, the action you can see exactly how it went in on each services and why it failed on a specific one that is very helpful uh, to have correlation id so this is what i have prepared for this uh, talk uh, thank you very much and if you have a question uh, try to send me an email or write a question here i am more than uh, willing to discuss different topics with you uh, when it comes to service bus and uh, microservices this is this is my email here and uh, you can reach me on that or try to send me a question here Thank you very much. Question here. I am more than uh, willing to discuss different topics with you uh, when it comes to. Uh, thank you, Burim, for this talk and the great explanation you made about microservices and services. Uh, I would have liked to ask you uh, what is the role of open source uh, on the development of. Uh, this architecture, the microservices, why do you think it's important and uh, how does it affect the improvement of it? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the, the, the last part one more time, please? The last part, what's the impact and uh, why, why is it important and what's uh, the effort that it takes uh, to, to make... Uh, to, uh, integrate uh, a microservice and its relation to open source uh, uh, microservice architecture is is a plan for all the type of system so it uh, it can be used from uh, any or it can use in any system and uh, the open source or the similar something that is to Azure service bus is something called the RabbitMQ. There are many others. It can be Kafka. It can be many others that can run on premise, and uh, they can be used uh, free. Uh, they can be used for free. No, no license or no uh, other things are needed for them. As soon as you can set up them by yourself. So benefits is uh, the whole architecture using uh, service bus will be more relaxed because consuming those messages means that the uh, services will be able to consume them whenever they're ready um so about all technologies who don't use the microservice architectures what about them how easy it would be to 
uh, take that architecture and uh, build the micro service architectures based on the old one. Actually, sometimes it's good to have all one in place because the domain uh, will be more more easy to understand. And breaking a monolithic to microservices, I think that's the more secure way of doing it. Uh, going that path is more secure than doing something big bang from the beginning. Uh, so uh, having having the um, the uh, actual or let's say old or legacy system might help you very much on the way by breaking uh, it into smaller chunks and uh, build microservices around it or uh, end up with the whole system using microservice architecture. Um, so how uh, all, tra all traditional uh, apps and uh, apps that are built with um, uh, microservice architecture, how can they work together in the same environment? Is that possible? One more time, how apps can work within the same... Um, uh, how old stuff can work with the new architectures on the same environment? Uh, that, of course, depends on how you set up the environment, but um, microservice architecture is not bound to any, to any technology. That's the good part of the microservice. You can build different microservices using d different technology and uh, uh, you can, they can communicate with each other either through service bus or through HTTP calls. So uh, that is uh, that is how can can be done. One thing is using technology that is that fits the requirements of your environment. I understand. So thank you, Grim, for this talk and your answers and this whole explanation. Thank you. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank so, you very much. Um, next session, we have keynote public money and public code by Alexander Sander.